Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? I know you're out there. I can feel you now. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came to tell you how it's going to begin. I'm going to hang up this phone, and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. A world where anything is possible. Where we go from there is a choice I leave to you. All right, um, before, I, before we get started, as Captain America says, anyone want to get off? I might start the video with that one. Anyway, before we get started, I just want to make a couple of disclaimers. Even though my channel, I try to make it accessible to everybody, and I try to simplify things so that the vast majority of people can understand it and get something out of it. Everything on this channel is not meant for everybody. You know, I have three levels on this channel, right? Uh, low, medium, and high, okay? Sometimes you can't simplify things, uh, especially when you want to document stuff. And basically, the thing about black folks is they don't like to document things. And that's fine as long as it's social. As long as the stuff is social, it's fine. You don't have to document things. It's not necessary to cite things. You're just talking. And when I rant and when I do morning talks, I'm just talking. I talk about subjects. And guess what happens when I do talk about subjects? Guess what Negroes do? Where did you get that from? Where can I read it? What book did it come out of? Prove your point. And it happens a lot, especially when I'm in a chat and I say something. First thing people want to say, well, cite your source. Now, nobody else has to cite their source. Nobody else has to prove anything. All they have to do is give an opinion. When I say it, I got to cite my source. I got to prove it. I got to back everything I say up with something. And when I ask them for the same thing, guess what they give me? They give me basically nothing, which is fine because I know who I'm getting into an argument with or getting into a discussion with. And increasingly, you know, I, I have withdrawn from arguing with people over stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not arguing with people that don't read. You know, that this is... 20, you know, 2022, and I've spent eight years uh, debating with people that don't read, that can't cite their source, they can't back what they say up with anything except rhetoric. Second thing I want to get to before we get started, most people that, that quote welfare are talking about, you know, they're talking about, in fact, talk about the Monaghan scissors, they're quoting abandonment as a source for welfare. They don't understand the welfare laws as they existed then because people think that all laws are static. The laws now are the same as the laws 60 years ago, 50 years ago, which is not true. Because there's one person that's talking about that uh, the reason for welfare going up is because Negroes left the house, that women didn't kick them out of the house. It was that was not true. I might I probably will have to do it because the thing is, is if Negroes don't read and Negroes don't research. So really what, what Negroes are arguing about is they want you to do the research for them because they're too fucking lazy to do it their own goddamn selves, right? So you have to do it and you have to point it out and you have to prove them wrong so then they don't have to do the work of proving their own point or informing themselves. They don't have to dig through the muck and the mire like you did. They can just pick it off of you because you give, you've given them what they need. And so increasingly I'm getting tired of giving black folks and Negroes stuff for free because they want to start an argument. That's how come normally I ignore the arguments because I'm not doing to do the research for free just because you got mad. But I'm going to say this. This is a freebie. Welfare from the state 
which the state increasingly took over because it, you, welfare used to be a private thing. It was from the church or, or local organization. It was not funded by taxes, it was charity. And going all the way back to English law, welfare was given to, uh, to women who were basically widows and orphans. In other words, if a woman's husband died, then the state would step in or the church would step in and help take care of her and give her a stipend. This is where welfare comes from. And up until 1935, welfare was meant for widows and orphans. If you had a living husband, it was very difficult for you to get welfare. Some states, some cities allowed for what they call abandonment. So if you did have a husband, legal or otherwise, and a child did have a father, and you went to the local church, in fact, uh, Frazier actually points this out several times in his book, that they allowed for abandonment, but that was not a state-run thing, okay? In 1935, after the depression started, a lot of fathers, white fathers had to leave the home to find work. So they quote unquote, technically abandoned the family. So a white woman, she'd actually go to the welfare office and ask for welfare and didn't have to produce a death certificate. She didn't have to produce a, a certificate to say the husband died. She just say the husband left the home and she doesn't know his whereabouts, which is very common. In, in, in welfare in the United States, right? Very common. Where the daddy at? I don't know. When was the last time you seen him? I ain't seen him in six months, a year, something like that. Basically, it goes down as abandonment. And then up until 1973, I do believe, I have to go back and look at the book. To get welfare, you have to have had been married and have children. And either the husband was dead because they changed, you know, they, that was always the case. And, or the husband had abandoned you, which is AF, AF, AFDC changed that in 1935 for abandonment. So in the Monaghan report, when they list welfare going up because of abandonment, as it's listed, is that because that is what the woman would have to tell the welfare office if she wanted welfare. My husband abandoned me. I don't know where he is. So she's not going to say I kicked the Negro out because he couldn't find a job or we couldn't get along. There was no such thing as irreconcilable differences because that was not going to fly. They could not check that out on a piece of paper. And anybody that's been around a social worker, they're going to coach the woman what to say. She wants their welfare. She's got to check off certain boxes so that the paperwork can go through and this woman can get her assistance. That's where the abandoned issue comes from capiche all right now that that has uh i got that out of the way that explanation out of the way for people for the negroes in the back like i said this is uh freedom is not enough this is uh talking about the monahan report that's a book written on monahan and around the monahan report uh it's before it happened and after it happened so this freedom is not enough is is actually written by a historian um, who actually was alive at the time and worked in Washington D.C. because I think his father was a was a congressman and he's a historian out of Yale. <clears throat> so he decided on I think it was the 60th anniversary of the Monahan Report. He decided to write a book about the Monahan Report and uh, I think I played his. In fact, I know I played his whole interview his old uh, discussion about the book on YouTube. But this is for people that read, okay? I'm gonna try to hit the highlighted portions to not make it too long. But um, if, it's, if it's too long, don't read. You're not a reader. This is, this is you, don't, you don't like academic stuff. You don't like uh, citations. You don't like book stuff like that. Hey, it's not for you. If you don't like a video that I put out, it's too highbrow or too educated or whatever you think it is, don't look at it. Come back when I have something that's more fun, more social, okay? I don't think that's too hard. Everybody is not equal, okay? Everybody doesn't like the same things. And I don't put out the same things. I put out a variety of things. Like most people are not interested in the universal, universal basic income or uh, how currency works or how the gold system works, or geopolitics, 
even though I constantly get these questions, most people are not interested in it. So I put out stuff for people that uh, that are interested in certain things. So I just put them out there, put a video up. People that are interested, look. And the people that don't, look. Like my dark news is not for everybody, but I think it's interesting for black folks to know it. So I put stuff out. Anyhow, um, this is this section is about the report. Okay, uh, Monahan went on. This is Monahan was saying that the Negro Americans will go beyond civil rights being Americans they will now expect to get that in their future equal opportunities for them as a group will be rough, produce roughly the same or equivalent results as compared with other groups which is fair Monahan went on this is not going to happen nor will it happen for generations to come unless a new and special effort is made in six short paragraphs Monahan Monahan gave two reasons for this prognosis. The first set forth in a memorable phrase, the racist virus in the American bloodstream still afflicts us. Negroes will encounter serious personal prejudice for at least another generation. So they're, they're re People say slavery is the reason. People imagine that the reasons for the report were actually outlined by certain things, okay? instead of reading what he actually says. Now, there's a reason that the races of virus exist called slavery and Jim Crow. The second, a key to the argument of the report as a whole was that three centuries of sometimes unimaginable mistreatment took their toll on the Negro people. Jim Crow did not end until 1968. You had formal slavery for 200 years and after emancipation, since the South is producing 80% of your wealth, 70, 80% of your wealth, you can't let the labor force go after you emancipate them. Otherwise, the country is going to do what's going to go broke, especially after you fought a civil war. You're going to have nothing because there's nobody there to produce the products that made you wealth. So what do you think the country is going to have to do once they free these people? They got to figure another way to put these people back where they were. That's Jim Crow, which they ran for another hundred years. Until guess what? They didn't need the people down uh, down south to actually produce the wealth anymore. And you had to have something to do with them. That's where the Kerner Commission comes in. But that's beside the point. We're actually, for you Negroes in the back, we're actually getting ahead of ourselves. And I know you guys, are, I have to go slow. The harsh fact is, at the present time, in terms of ability to win out in the competitions of American life, they are not equal to most of the groups which they will be competing. Claude Anderson said the same thing for about 40 years, that you reduce the Negro to a midget and you made white folks a 50 foot giant, economically. Still today, economically, they still complain about the same things. So in that sense, it really hasn't changed a whole lot. A little bit, but not a whole lot. Moreover, he added in these terms, the circumstances of the Negro American community in recent years has probably been getting worse, not better. The fundamental problem on hand then wrote, Fa the of family structure. The evidence, not final but powerfully persuasive, is that the Negro family in the urban ghettos is crumbling. A middle class group has managed to save itself, but for the vast numbers of unskilled, poorly educated city working class, the fabric of the conventional social relationship has all but disintegrated, which the Kerner Commission confirmed when they actually went in and did the surveys. <laughs> Everything that he's saying here was actually confirmed. In the Kerner Commission report, what was an actual study done by uh, President Johnson and about 1,500 people. Then they went to 20 urban cities and actually went on the ground and actually did a survey to actually confirm exactly what he's saying. So long as this situation persists, the cycle of poverty and disadvantage will continue to repeat itself. We're still complaining about it now. And this is this is some almost 60 years later. We're still complaining about this. I wonder why. Closing this preface, Monahan repeated his argument that the nation confronted a new kind of problem. He added, measures that have worked in the past that would work for most groups in the present will not work here. A national effort is required that will give a unity of purpose to the many activities of the federal government in this area directed to a new kind of national goal the establishment of a stable Negro family structure. Huh. The manosphere is damn near built on this. The manosphere is damn near built on this. Skipping down, even though he talked about 
Uh, just, you know, real quick. A middle class group, he reminded readers, has managed to save itself. There are indications that the situation may have been arrested in the past few years. Given equal opportunities, children of intact middle class families will perform as well or better than their white peers. Given equal opportunities. Black girls tend to do better in school and in the workforce than black men. Readers of the preface would also have realized that Monaghan was preaching an aggressively liberal message. He did not blame blacks living in ghettos for having fallen into the depths. The source of their trouble was three centuries of sometimes unimaginable mistreatment. Sometimes. Can we talk about Emmett Till or Jim, the Jim Crow South or the racist North and the racist practice in northern urban cities? that we still complain about. Milwaukee, Chicago, Philly, New York, DC, Stop and Frisk, Baltimore. Are you guys reading me? Boy, on 10% of your black boys can read. Are you feeling me? Problem persists. A national effort by the federal government must be mounted to combat the new crisis in race relations to help black people achieve equal results as well as equal opportunities. Dr. Claude Anderson said this a long time ago, just because you're set free to compete and somebody has like a 50 yard head start on you and a hundred yard dash, that doesn't mean you're gonna win. The opportunity is the same. If you can run fast enough and hard enough, you can run twice as fast and twice as hard, you can still win the race. But the likelihood of you winning is not going to be very likely. And I said, but we talk about the, the Johnson and, and Kennedy administration, but the Programs enacted in the first phase of the Negro Revolution, men power retraining, job training, community action, and the like only made opportunities available. They cannot ensure the outcome. Blacks, Monahan emphasized, were now engaged in a demand for equality. Quoting recent commentary essays by Bayard Rustin and Nathan Glazer, oh, he's quoting black people. Huh. To bolster his case, he emphasized a key argument of this report. The principal challenge of the next phase of the Negro Revolution is to make certain that equality of results will now follow. An ominous warning followed. If we do not, there will be no social peace in the United States for generations. Huh. Guess the Google was a prophet. Declaring that the deterioration of the Negro family is at the heart of the deterioration of the fabric of Negro society. Huh. Sounds a lot like this man could have been in the manosphere, in the black manosphere. We have been saying that for the eight years that I've been here. Hmm. Huh. Funny what you can find out when you actually read the report. The white family has achieved a high degree of stability, maintaining that stability. By contrast, the family of the lower class Negroes is highly unstable and in many urban centers approaching complete breakdown. Hmm. 70 80 percent out of wedlock rates uh, less than 30 percent marriage rate low marriage high divorce huh strange how that happens as if recognizing that he might appear to be overgeneralizing, monahan reminded readers that the negro community is dividing between stable middle class group that is steadily growing and stronger and more successful and an increasingly disorganized and disadvantaged lower class. But he went on to note that the emergence and increasing visibility of a Negro middle class may beguile the nation into supposing that the circumstances of the remainder of the Negro community are equally prosperous. How the fuck long have we been talking about that? Hmm. Whereas just the opposite is true at the present. It is likely to continue so. The lumping of all Negroes together in one statistical measure, measurement very probably conceals the extent of the disorganization among the lower class group. Could have wrote this yesterday. This is 60 years ago, folks. Skipping down. The average monthly employment rate for black males in 1964, he pointed out, was recorded at 9%. But during 1964, some 29% of Negro males were unemployed at one time or, or another. If 36% of Negro children were living in broken homes at any specific moment, it is likely that a far higher proportion of Negro children find themselves in situations at one time or another in their lives. Hmm. Having alerted his readers to the way statistics can be misunderstood, one hand crammed the rest of the chapter with graphs and tables, 
10 and 9 pages, many bold faced and capitalized headings summarize their findings. And this is 65. Nearly one quarter of urban Negro marriages are dissolved. Nearly one quarter of Negro births are now illegitimate. The non white illegitimacy is eight times the white ratio. Almost one fourth of non white families are headed by a woman. It's 1965. What is it now? 70%. Say they're saying that the Monaghan report is nothing. That's why. You, why do you think they refer back to this? Okay, this is the guy that actually raised the alarm. He raised the question. Okay, that's why people refer back to it as a starting point, not an ending point. The proportion of white births out of wedlock, for instance, had risen from two percent in 1940 to three percent in 1963. By contrast, the proportion for blacks during these years had jumped from 16.8% to 23.6%. There were remaining roughly eight times that among whites. In central Harlem, 43% of live births to non-white women were non-marital in 1963. In other words, they're using Harlem as a avatar for urban black folks. In many other cities, for example, Chicago, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Memphis, Washington, D.C., the proportion of non-white births out of wedlock had, res had risen substantially between 1950 and 1963, from around 20% in 1950 to 30% or more in 1963. The percent of non-white families headed by a white female was more than double the percent for whites. Fatherlessness, non-white families, increased by 17% between 1950 and 1960, but held constant for white families. Monhan added only a minority of Negro children reached the age of 18, having lived with all their lives with both parents. What do we talk about in the black community? How do we describe it? When we talk about the black community, when we talk about Moynihan, when we talk about What's wrong with the black community? We start with the black family. We start with fathers not being in the home or black children not, not having both their parents, right? Still today, 60 years later, but he's wrong, okay? The breakdown of the Negro family has led to start a startling increase in welfare dependency. A total of 14% of non-white children, he wrote, were receiving AFDC assistance compared with 2% of white children. 8% of white children got such assistance at some time in their lives compared with 56% of non-whites. Deploring the inadequacy of the program, he added, let it be noted, however, that out of a total of 1.8 million non-white illegitimate children in the nation in 1961, 1 1.3 million were not receiving aid under AFDC. Although a substantial number have or will receive aid at some time in their lives. Again, the report emphasized the situation may be worsening. One hand had explained that AFDC had been intended mainly to provide care for needy, say it with me folks, widows and orphans. In 1935, only one third of the families covered were families in which the father had deserted. What was I saying about that? What, that the FDR changed the rule in 1935 to allow for desertion because of the uh, depression and fathers had to leave the home to find work, okay? In 1935, only one third of families covered were families in which the father had deserted. Today, it's two thirds. The Department of Health, Education and Welfare, HEW, he said, estimated that between two thirds and three fourths of the 50% increase from 1948 to 1955 in the number of absent father families receiving AFDC could be explained by the increase in broken homes in the population. Moynihan concluded the steady expansion of this welfare program as of public assistance programs in general can be taken as a measure of a steady disintegration of the Negro family structure over the past generation in the United States. When people cherry pick what they want, now they spent three hours. They could have gone over the whole report in the three hours. They didn't. How come? Because you're trying to construct a narrative instead of reading what the report actually says. The roots of the problem. On one hand, turn to the causes of these unhappy developments. In other grim statistics and explanations of Frazier, Glazier, and Elkins. Okay, these are black sociologists concerning slavery, the dominance of the woman in the slave families in the United States. 
I may have to do something with that because you Negroes are hard-headed, y'all. You guys are not going to pick up a book. You're not going to study. You're not going to investigate. You're not going to research. You're going to flap your gums. The research is there. Books are there. This this book alone names about 20 texts that Monahan used to put into this report. And to be fair, I haven't read all of them. But the but the but the whole paper is named after E. Franklin Frazier's book, The Negro Family in the United States. It's the whole report is named after that book. How many people have even picked up a Frazier's book and read it? Even sections of it. The only people that even have read sections of it is because I put it in the video and I actually read sections of it. I have to give one of the brothers credit. He actually picked up the book and actually read out of it. Now his conclusions were all screwed up, but I have to give him credit for reading it. And the appearance of the Sambo personality, he quickly narrated the miseries of reconstruct reconstruction and of the late 19th century when Jim Crow made its, in its appearance. Nobody talks about Jim Crow. Oh, you niggas talking about slavery. Nobody talks about Jim Crow. Jim Crow made its appearance and when keeping the Negro in his place can be translated as keeping the Negro male in his place. Female, the female was not a threat to anyone. Jimson Danius, uh, male dominance theory, social male dominance theory, Jimson Danius, the man not by Tommy Curry. I just quoted a section from Dr. Neal's book, it says the exact same thing. Go, they actually quoted Elizabeth Cady Stanton back in 1865 talking about keeping the Negro male in his place after civil after the Civil War. That's how come the suffragettes abandoned civil rights, abandoned uh, uh, ant abolition because they were afraid that the Negro male was going to get more rights than they had. So they constructed a narrative. Negroes don't read. The, these historical developments were quickly covered in two and a half pages. But coming as they did at the start of the chapter, it was easy to see that he considered them powerful sources of present of the present day problem. Monahan colorfully explained that these events worked against the emergence of a strong father figure. The very essence of the male animal from the bantam rooster to the four star general to strut. But not for the male Negro, the sassy nigger was lynched. Monahan went on. However, to argue that slavery and Jim Crow were not the only sources of the contemporary black social ills. Urbanization of the population which advanced in the 20th century was immensely disruptive of social patterns. In other words, your social grouping or your culture was built for what? Being in the South, working in the fields, under Jim Crow and slavery. That's what it's built on. What happens when you go into a city where you don't have the same kind of kinship networks in, in a rural area, gonna dissolve. He drawing on Frazier, E. Franklin Frazier, and his own writings in Beyond the Melting Pot, he declared this was an abrupt transition to produce wild Irish, the wild Irish slums of the 19th century in the Northeast. They, they, said, they said the same goddamn thing in the Kerner Commission, which I just did. I just did a video on that, confirming what Monaghan is saying here. In our own time, the same and sudden transition has produced the Negro slum. He said in 65 to confirm it in 67. Different from, but hardly better than its predecessor and fundamentally the result of the same process. After citing Frazier at length, after citing Frazier at length, E. Franklin Frazier, Monahan featured a bar graph showing that one third of non-white children live in broken homes compared with only 10% of white children, three to one, and still maintain. The highest percentages were in urban areas. He then summed up his own view. In every index of family pathology, divorce, separation, and desertion, female family head, children in broken homes, and illegitimacy, the contrast between urban and rural environment for Negroes families is unmistakable mic drop the closing pages of the roots of the problem devoted considerable space to unemployment and poverty Moynihan focused the impact of structural forces impeding black americans for large bar graphs illustrated the close causal connection between non-white male unemployment rates and illegitimacy and family disruption we're still talking about it today they talked about it in 1987 they talked about it in 1995. They talked about it in 2005. They talked about it in uh, with Obama in you know in 2008. They, they just I just they just did a report about black male unemployment, about 
uh, about 10 million jobs out there and they're not hiring black men. Just did one. Here, as throughout the report was the, it was the plight of the black men rather than that of the woman, especially that especially disturbed him. Rates of black male joblessness, he showed, had grown since World War II and had normally been two times higher than those among whites. In 1963, a prosperous year, 29.2% of Negro, all Negro men in the labor force did not have a job at some point during the year. Almost half of these men were unemployed 15 weeks or more. Using a favorite word, fundamental, Moynihan deplored a long-standing situation. The, the fundamental overwhelming fact is that the Negro unemployment, with the exception of a few years during World War II and the Korean War, had continued at disaster levels for 35 years. One of Moynihan's most striking graphs presented the relationship between non-white male unemployment in 1960 and the percentage of non-white births out of wedlocks in 1963. These out of wedlock birth rates, out of wedlock birth proportions were 40% or more in tracks where non-white male unemployment rates of 12% or more. The tangle of pathology, Moynihan's next longest and for his critics, the most incendiary chapter opened by reiterating the Negro community had paid a fearful price for incredible mistreatment to which it has been subjected over the past three centuries. This mistreatment, and this is where women, especially feminists get upset. This mistreatment has forced many black families into a matriarchal structure, which because it was so out of touch with the rest of the American society, seriously retards the progress of this of the group as a whole and imposes a crushing burden on the Negro male. Monaghan should have been in the black manosphere. I'm sorry. And in consequence, on a great many Negro women as well, because if the male's not working, can't take care of family, guess what's gonna happen to her? Monaghan elaborated on this point. There is no special reason why a society which males are dominant in family relationship, it, is to be preferred to a matriarchal arrangement. However, it is clearly a disadvantage for a minority group to be operating on one principle while the great majority of the population and the one with the most advantages to begin with is operating on another. In other words, you're out of step with the people that are most successful in this environment. It's his job to actually correct the situation. That's why he wrote the report. That's what he was tasked with. That's what happened why they burnt down like 30 cities in 1967 and they had the Kerner Commission. And what did they fucking find out? They found out exactly what he's saying. Skipping down, it was by destroying the Negro family under slavery that white America broke the will of the Negro people. Although that will has reasserted itself in our time, it's resurgence, it's, although, look at this, look at this, okay? Look at this. Just look at it. Although that will has resurfaced, reasserted itself in our time, its resurgence is doomed to frustration unless the viability of the Negro family is restored. Look at that. I can I can stop the whole recording right now. The whole manosphere has been talking about this shit for eight years. Yet the Monaghan report is not viable. He dropped the mic back in 1965. He dropped the mic back then, but y'all don't y'all don't hear me though. Y'all don't read. Y'all read to argue, just like you listen to argue. You listen to respond. You don't listen to understand. Let me put a star next to this one. I know Dr. Johnson. I'm putting foot to ass. Okay. I'm sorry. Skipping down. Don't want to make this too long. One study he added showed that. Children from fatherless homes seek immediate immediate gratification of their desires far more than the children from fathers present. He sensed his case by citing a favorite source, Thomas Pettigrew, a Harvard psychologist who was among the contributors of the Daedalus issues on the Negro American. Pettigrew wrote, can effectively compensate for the restrictions of the Negro child. Faces outside of the ghetto, consequently the type of home uh, home life a Negro child enjoys and may be far more crucial for governing the influence of segregation upon his personality than the form of segregation takes legal or informal in the southern or northern. Skipping down, let's, let's, let's tighten this up. 
Near the end of the Tangle of Pathology, Monahan reiterated in an obviously heartfelt manner the argument he had made in the One Third of the Nation report in 1964. Blacks had a high failure rate of 56%, almost four times that of whites. On the Armed Forces Mental Test, okay, going back to the mental test, how come black kids cannot get into the Armed Forces, which it's the same thing that guess who said that just a few weeks ago with our beloved Charles Faulkner. If more Negro men had been accepted by the services, the unemployment in 1964 would have been 7% instead of 9%. Moreover, service in the military is the only experience open to the Negro American in which he is truly treated as an equal above all the military. It is an utterly masculine world given the strains of the disorganized and matrifocal family life with so many negro youth come out of age the armed forces are dramatic and desperately needed change a world away from women a world run by strong men of unquestioned authority where discipline if harsh is nonetheless orderly and predictable and where rewards if limited are granted on the basis of performance charles just said that Cerulean Gray just said that. But guess what? Don't have an, if only 10% of your boys can read at, at, at reading level, guess what happens? They can't fucking pass the test. That was 1965, folks. What, what, is, what has changed in 30 years? What's changed in fucking 30 years? We just had a report on the Baltimore schools where your, your blunt, young black boys are uh, basically have a 1.4 grade average. They're failing most of their classes, not even going, skipping down. Observers, Monahan wrote, report that the Negro churches have all but lost contact with northern cities. The sole exception, according to him, was the rise of the black Muslims. <laughs> Dr. Thunder just did a, Dr. Neal and Dr. Thunder just did a video about uh, this exact same thing. You can't make this shit up, man. You can't make this stuff up. The closest he came to such answers was in his final chapter, The Case for National Action. It was only a page and a half, a brief space considering the systemic and pernicious problems he hoped to solve. He began by giving the three reasons the report was written to define a situation rather than propose solutions to it. It was only a question, a proposal for the study. The study was not done until 1967. The Kerner Commission was that study. Nobody talks about the Kerner Commission. That's why Art of Itmore, you know, God bless him, decided to do a series of videos talking about this very thing. The Monhead Report was the question. The answers to the solutions to the problem was actually in the Kerner Commission. A lot of which were implemented. Not well enough, but they were actually implemented. A lot of stuff that you get for affirmative action, housing, schools, admission to colleges, Affirmative action on the job, EEOC, uh, elimination of racial profiling with police, all this kind of stuff came out of what? The Kerner Commission. Second, the problem is so interrelated one thing to another that any list of program proposals would necessarily be incomplete and would distract attention from the main point of, of the interrelatedness. Third reason, Moynihan lamented, was that our study has produced some clear indications that the situation may indeed to have begun to feed upon itself. To emphasize the point which a graph that had indicated earlier, he described the statistical relationship between uh, welfare and, un and unemployment, later dubbed Monaghan Scissors. He didn't, he didn't call it Monaghan Scissors. It was later dubbed Monaghan Scissors. That he and Barton had found so stunning. He, he found it. He didn't, he didn't propose a reason why, okay? There was a, 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 a stat that he found that shocked him, which is why the report came out in the first place. For most of the post-war period, he wrote, male Negro unemployment and the number of AFDC cases rose and fell together if as if connected by a chain. In 1960, however, and again in 63 and 64, unemployment declined, but the number of AFD cases rose. Why is that? Three centuries of injustice have brought about a deep-seated structural dislocations in the life of the Negro American. At this point, the present tangle of pathology is capable of perpetuating itself without assistance from the white world. Mic drop.
by pointing structural dislocations. One hand re it was reiterating an argument by Frazier, Murdoch, Clark, Young, and Sibelman. These first four are all black. Mur oh, except for Murdoch. Murdoch's white. Murdoch was actually a classic book, actually read by uh, a lot of uh, people in the conscious community. But Clark, but Frazier, Clark, and Young were all people that he talked to. He couldn't talk to Dubois because Dubois was already dead. Even though he, that's how come he didn't put Dubois into the report is because he couldn't talk to him directly. Racist oppression over centuries, uh, along with economic changes following industrialization, urbanization had badly damaged black people, especially, especially black men. Indeed, he emphasized the plight of many lower class black males, rendering them unwilling unable or unwilling to marry support families. Same thing that the Kerner Commission said when they actually went in and did the study. That's exactly what they found. Intensified already problematically gender relations, Jesus Christ. By using conditional language, the problem may have begun to feed upon itself. The tangle of pathology is capable of perpetuating itself. Monahan stopped short of, of a flat declaration that the structural dislocation had shattered black, had shattered black culture. Moreover, he was explicit in arguing that more study was needed. Possible implications of these and other data he warned are serious enough that they do that they too should be understood before program proposals are made. In other words, you need to do further study and further examination before you actually put in a program that does not work. That's what the Kerner Commission was for. And other studies after that. That Monahan did not try to give precise answers to hard questions was hardly surprising. For for some time after, scholars and activists debated over why the proportion of black children were born out of wedlock was rapidly increasing. Indeed, even as he wrote, this proportion was escalating more dramatically than he might have imagined. By 1970, he had jumped to 38% compared with 6% among whites. In other words, it went from 23, in five years, it went from 23% 23.6% in 1965 to 38% in five years. I did not know then, he wrote in 1995, I do not know now exactly why the scissors effect developed when it did. All I had in 1965 was the scissors. Something was happening. Let's see what else we got. I think that's all the highlighted stuff that I have. And I think that's long enough. My spiritual teacher, my professor, my spiritual teacher, my financial advisor, and my political advisor, who was white, Craig Hewlett, said you gotta bring books to the book. You cannot read one book. My spiritual teacher, Dadisi, said you always gotta bring more books to the book. One book does not stand up on its own. Craig Hewlett said you gotta read at least 10 you know, on the one subject. When you study something, you gotta read at least 10 books. At least 10 to get a good grasp of what you're, what you're talking about. You can't just read the Monahan Report by itself. You gotta bring books to the book. The Kerner Commission was the study, but nobody talks about the Kerner Commission. That's how come me and Art of Itmore actually going over. So we don't care if you don't like it. We don't care if you want to read it. This is for people that want to know. And most people don't even pick up, you know, pick up the study or even look at it. But instead of reading the whole report, instead of bringing books to the book, you Negroes quote a few sections and then flap your gums for two hours. Really? Is that what we're doing? Is this what we call knowledge? Is this what we call information? Is this what the Manosphere is about? I came to the Black Manosphere to inform Black men. That's my job. If you want to entertain Black men, that's somebody else's job. It's not mine. I'm not here for that. You can't tell me how to talk. You can't tell me what information I need to present. You can't tell me how to run my channel. You got two choices, and I've said this from the very beginning. When I first had my channel, my channel was built for 500 people. 500 people that actually want this information, that actually want to know, and that's going to do something with it. Everybody else, you're welcome to engage. You're welcome to pick up knowledge. You're welcome to pick up the bits and pieces and apply it as you can, okay, as you understand it. My channel's not built to actually coddle people. It's not. I'm sorry. If you want to feel good at night and you want somebody to go there, there and babysit you, I'm sorry. I'm not here for that. If that's you, you, man, you, you got, I am one guy amongst what, a thousand, uh, not even a thousand, maybe a few hundred 
content creators in the black manosphere. I'm one guy. You don't like it? Okay, that's fine. You don't like the PhDs? You don't you don't like what they represent and what they teach? Okay. My job is to get them here so they can present the information for people that need it and can use it. Because there's the black manosphere is not just the, 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 the Negroes or the black folks on the street or the working class guys. You got black manosphere people that are in colleges that have to go up against feminists or trying to get their PhDs or trying to get their degree or trying to get a job in corporate America. Okay, They have to, they have to fight against this stuff. They got to mate with women at that level with high value men, whatever you want to call them, that have to deal with this kind of stuff. You have to deal with these arguments. You have to deal with your feminist teacher. If you got kids, especially if, if you have black boys, how do you uh, how do you advocate for black boys without this kind of stuff? Because this is the kind of stuff they're going to use against you. All that stuff in the street about plain talk and Negro talk and swag is not going to work. When you try to pass laws, swag doesn't work when it gets to Washington, D.C. When it gets to Congress, swag is not going to work. Swag is not going to help you get programs for black boys. I don't care whether it's tech. Well, we need to teach tech. You're not going to get tech programs. You're not going to get affirmative action programs to get boys and men into tech to get jobs. Because if you let it, the, 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 the Asians, the Indians, and the white folks are going to push you out. They're not going to let you in. They've already stolen information from, from black people. The, the scholars that we do have that actually develop parts of tech. They already pushed them out because you don't have this. They shoot Negroes down because you don't have this. They underfund your schools because you don't have this. And then you let you elect black women to sit on boards that, that will allow this kind of stuff to go on because you don't have it. You don't have nothing to argue with. This is your sword. This is your key. This is your you know, this this is your weapon to fight against that kind of bullshit. But if you don't read it properly, you don't bring books to the book, you don't understand what this stuff says and what the Kerner Commission says and what the facts on the ground is to argue against and, and counter their narratives, guess what's going to happen? Nothing. Now, if you guys are happy with the way it is and the way the black community is going, which is actually going down into the dumpster at a rap in an increasingly rapid rate, then fine, let it work the way it is. My job is just to get you the information. You don't want to use it? Ain't no sweat on my nose. I'm a Gnostic. My job is actually to, is to teach it, not to make you do it. I'm like Yoda. I care or I care not. I don't have any attachment. As a Jedi, as, as an old Jedi, you got to give up attachments. I've given up attachment to the outcome of what this goes on. Y'all don't want it? By all means, ignore it. My job is to give it. That's my rant. But like I said, I don't want to make this too long. I'm just giving, as, as, as the kids say, some pushback against ignorance. That's why I don't engage in this kind of stuff anymore. I am tired of it. Tired of engaging in, in, in uh, intellectual masturbation with people that don't use intellect. Sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Take it someplace else. You know, Edward had on a chick for, for an hour and a half that didn't know what the fuck she was talking about and entertained it. And my resistance to this kind of psycho babble is very low. That's why I don't want to engage in it anymore. So if you got beefs, you got psycho babble beefs, keep that shit over there, man. I don't want, I don't want to engage in that kind of stuff. I, I no, I wasn't raised on a hip hop street beefs. Okay. When in my neck of the woods, in my neck of the woods, and basically Dennis Sperling, who's raised basically in my neighborhood, to tell you, street beefs get you killed in Los Angeles. I don't know what it does on the East Coast, but on the West Coast, in LA, in, in Northern California, if you got a street beef on somebody in the neighborhood, that will normally wind up getting you killed. I learned that at 11 years old, when a new kid came into the neighborhood and, and the local bully and his gang picked on the wrong person. He started a street beef with the wrong person. He got two bullets to his head. I went to his funeral and I saw his body at 11 years old. That's what I know about street beef. That's how come I grew up knowing to squash a beef on the street. I don't beef. There's a reason I don't beef. Um, because in my neck of the woods, a beef in LA will get you put into the ground real quick. You don't start them, 
you try to squash them or you try to separate because that's going to get one of you two killed. So a lot of people in LA with a street beef, we agree to disagree and we, we part. In other words, that's where I don't you know what they, they term. I don't fuck with that nigga. That's where it comes from. Anyhow, let me jump off here before it gets too long. This is BGS out. I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace.